Well, welcome to Mountain Christian Church this morning, or welcome to your breakfast table, or to your desk, or uh, or maybe you're just propped up in bed. I don't know where uh, it might be that you might be uh, joining us from this morning, but we are so grateful to have you here with us. Um, I want to say a couple of things. First, I want to say uh, how much I hate this. I, I hate the fact that uh, we don't have a room full of faces and a room full of voices and, and a room full of God's people and a, and a room full of, of warmth and, and God's love and God's presence by His Spirit present in each one of you. I hate that. Um, God, God knew what He was doing, didn't He, when He told us to meet together, when He told us we needed each other when he told us that fellowship was how he designed it. So there's a sense in which I, I hate it this morning. I also want to say that I love this. Um, I, I've said this before, but I'm, I'm jealous for this opportunity this morning. As we are scattered, um, we're still the body of Christ. Uh, no one can close down the church. Not any government, not any authority, uh, no man, um, not even Satan himself. No one can close down the church because the body of Christ um, is still alive and well today and is working and has been all week and will continue this week. Brother or sister, if you trust in Christ and he lives in you, then the church will go where you go. So um, I am so loving the fact that we can gather together. We can sing a bit. Um, we can gather around God's word. We can bow our heads together and pray. So I'm just going to ask wherever you are this morning. I know that there are many of us coming in from all different places. Um, I'm asking wherever you are to, uh, to just be a little adventurous with us this morning. W would you sing with us wherever you are? Um, I dare you to. I don't know if there are people asleep in your household. Uh, but anyway, as you feel led, but that would be cool. Would you pray with us when we pray? Would you bow your head and join in prayer? Would you carve out this time and set aside other distractions? Would you make this uh, an hour for worship? That would be awesome. Ultimately, I know there may be distractions, things you can't help. God knows that, and he is honored just by your being here this morning. Let's, let's begin as we're going to start with a couple of uh, songs and praise together. Before we do that, let's just go to the Lord together in prayer. Join me. Great God, our Father. I thank you so much that your people today can gather in your name. We cannot all be in the same room as we would love. But Lord, we gather. Your spirit that has made us one cannot be broken, cannot be taken, and cannot be stopped. Lord, I ask this morning, would you meet us? Would you make this truly a time of worship in our own hearts and in our own lives? Holy Spirit, would you have room to move in us this morning that we might be changed because we've been here for these moments. Might you speak and might we have ears and hearts and wills to hear and respond. Lord God, we love you. We pray for your peace for our own souls first. We pray for ourselves first because we're the most needy of all that we know. But Lord, we pray also for our leaders of our nation and our governments we pray for our healthcare workers, for their protection. We pray for wisdom for decisions being made. We pray for small businesses and business owners for your provision. Lord God, we just pray for your help in a myriad of ways. We also ask, as we give you these moments, would you meet us now? Because we need to be made new. We need to be rescripted by your word. Would you cast us into our places as you have written for us? a perfect plan to play out. And would you give us hearts to follow you with zeal and with everything we've got? We just want to tell you, Lord, this morning, we love you, and nothing would stop us from worshiping you. We'll give you all the glory as you meet with us, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. All right, bring up the music team.
36 through 39 says, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. 
The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. John 16.33 says, I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world.
Thank you guys so much for, for leading us. And uh, thank you all for joining in and singing with us. If you have your Bibles, you want to follow along this morning, 2 Samuel chapter 19. <clears throat> 2 Samuel chapter 19 is where we'll be, so go ahead and uh, grab a Bible. You may want to find something to take notes if, uh, if you'd like to do that. Jot down a few things to consider and come back to and maybe pray through later on. All right, hopefully you'll get what you need. And then let's go ahead and uh, go to the Lord again in prayer and invite Him just to minister to us. Would you uh, join me and pray again? Lord our God, we, we can't gather in person, but we can gather in your name, and we can gather around your word. As we have prayed for wisdom for our leaders, and we have prayed for um, protection for our, our health care workers and others, we have prayed for provision for families and, and businesses. So Lord, now we, um, we come and we pray for your people. Lord, I pray that through our time together this morning, Lord, would you, would you give your people boldness and not fear? Because that is not the spirit that we are given. I am reminded by a young man who posted that this week. Give us boldness. Lord, give your people love. Even as we, we just sang, would you, would you open up our eyes to those around us so that you might use us? Lord, would you give to your, your people a joy in this season that's not because of circumstances, but a peace that passes understanding and a joy which is a fruit of your spirit in us, that we might be a light wherever you've placed us, a light through all of our interactions this week. And Lord, we ask right now, would you give your word so that your people, so that we might be fed? Holy Spirit, come, take this word, it's your word. Come and speak it now, we are your people. Come and do your work and be glorified here. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. We come to 2 Samuel chapter 19. Uh, this is where we left off a couple weeks ago. Actually, it's in the middle of uh, 2 Samuel 19. We'll be picking up in verse 9 today. Um, it, it's just two weeks ago that we were together in 2 Samuel 19, but man, that seems like an eternity ago. Uh, David had been driven out of town. David, the rightful king, the anointed king of the nation of Israel, um, through his own sin, has now found himself in a place and in a time in his life where he's uh, reaping the consequences of his sin. And though God has forgiven him because his repentance has been profound, his heart has been broken, he is truly a man changed um, as a result of having been exposed for his very devious and dreadful sin. Yet there are still consequences that he is having to walk through. And one of those is the very, um, the very sword, the violence, uh, the treachery that he now finds in, an, in his own household. And he'll find that through many, many episodes. But probably one of the biggest is this episode with Absalom, his son, who steals away the hearts of the people, proclaims himself king, and then drives the rightful king David, his father, drives him out of town. David uh, has passed this way before, and uh, along the way he's seen many people and met them. Then David and his men have uh, won a battle. They won the battle against Absalom, and Absalom's life has been forfeit. The usurper is now gone. So in chapter 19, David now returns, and he passes by many of the same people along the way. The question of this chapter is really this. Who will step forward? And make him king again. Who will return to him as the rightful king, the rightful Lord who sits on the throne and demonstrate full loyalty? How will we, even, even in our own lives at times when we maybe have been unfaithful, how will we return to the one who is the king? Chapter 19 is the return of the king, and it gives us a clear call, just as it was a clear call in, in that day for the nation of Israel, as it has been for God's people in the generations since this has been written, who have read this passage. This has been the message for them, and so it is for us today. In a day of divided loyalties, how will we follow the one true king? 
The passage begins with the uh, northern tribes of Israel, and they're all in a tizzy. Because now that Absalom is dead, they're not really sure what to do. Many of them have been traitorous and left following David and followed Absalom instead. And even in Judah, David's own tribe, his own people, there is hesitation at this point. But David, David is going to reach out to some of these rebels, and he tells them to return. Return to the king. That's the first portion of our passage this morning. Return to the king. Pick up with me 2 Samuel 19, and I'm going to read the first portion starting in verse, uh, verse 9. All the people were quarreling throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us, that's David, the king delivered us from the hand of our enemies, and he saved us from the hand of the Philistines. But now he has fled out of the land of Absalom, from Absalom. However, Absalom, whom we anointed over us, has died in battle. Now then, why are you silent about bringing the king back? So this is the, the other tribes arguing over what do we do now, and should we follow David? Verse 11, Then King David said to Zadok and Abiathar the priest, saying, Speak to the elders of Judah, saying, Why are you the last to bring the king back to his house, since the word of Israel has come to the king, even to his house? You are my brothers, you are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? Say to Amasa, Are you not my bone and my flesh? May God be so to me, may God do so to me, and more also, if you will not be commander of the army before me continually in the place of Joab. Thus he turned the hearts of all the men of Judah as one man, so that they sent word to the king, saying, Return, you and all your servants. The king then returned and came as far as the Jordan. And Judah came to, meet, came to Gilgal in order to meet the king, to bring the king across the Jordan. Pause there. Israel, as I said, is in a quandary in those first couple of verses. They had followed God's anointed king at one time, but recently they've now tried to oust him. Since Absalom is dead, they're wondering what to do next. In verse 9, it says that they were quarreling throughout all of those northern tribes. But they remember something. They remember that David has been God's king for them. The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines. So now they're wondering, at this point, do we go back? Should we go back and follow David the king? Notice, in fact, that many of these will choose to return to the king. That's what we get down in verse 11. David appeals to Judah, his own tribe, and he says to him and says to them in verse 11, um, Why are you the last to bring the king back to his house, since the word of all Israel has come to the king? In other words, there's now been a move amongst the tribes in Israel to reach out to David and say, We want to bring you back as king. David is the rightful king. The people are in a quandary. The king will return to the throne. In fact, he's always been the rightful king and always been on the throne in some sense. The question is, will the people return to the king? And so it is in the same way for us today, right? The Lord Jesus is the rightful king. Christ sits on the throne today, and though in some sense he's in exile, he does not rule over this world in a way that we can consciously see that everything is under his feet, but Hebrews tells us one day we will see everything placed under his feet. Christ is God's anointed. Christ is the rightful king. And he reigns today. And yet, sometimes we get confused. And we try to oust him. We try to turn to other kings. But our idols, in the end, they come up short. And in moments of clarity, the question is, will we remember? Will we remember the one who rescued us? Will we remember the one who delivered us? Will we remember the rightful king and return to him? Well, this is what Israel is wrestling with at this time, the northern tribes. But even in Judah, David's own tribe, many had been traitors. So notice how David comes. He comes with words of mercy. He comes with words of reassurance. Take a look at verse 12, how he reaches out to them through Zadok and Abiathar, the priests who were still faithful to David. Notice how he reaches out to his own tribe. You are my brothers, he says to them. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? Why is this such an important thing for David to say? Because so many, even in his own tribe in Judah, have revolted against David because Absalom, forgot his name, Absalom was pronounced king in Hebron. Hebron is in the heart of Judah. He reaches out to them and he says, So what for the rift? So what for the treachery? So what for the fact that you have 
turned against me? Are we not bone and flesh? Am I not yours? What a word of reassurance this is to those of us who have been traitors. What, what a word of reminder to those of us who have turned away from the Lord. And he says to us, no, I am yours, and you are mine, and that will not change. He goes on from there in 13 to give further reassurances. Say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? May God do so to me and more also, if you will not be commander of the army before me continually in place of Joab. Who was Amasa? Amasa was the commander who led Absalom's forces. David is reaching out to him, and he says, Amasa, I will not come back and take your life. I will not come back and bring vengeance, but rather I extend an olive branch. And I'm saying you have a place in my kingdom. David here, again, at least in this moment, is another place where he is a faithful picture of the rightful king. Reaching out to rebels. Reaching out to those of us who have even led campaigns against the, the honor and the glory of, of the one true God in his name by our own sin, by our own brokenness. And he reaches out to us and he says, no, I won't destroy you. You have a place. You have a place in my kingdom. You have a place in my enlistment, a place where I desire to use you. What words of mercy and what words of reassurance. God gives David favor. And the tribe of Judah hears these words and they're reconciled, verse 14. And so he turned the hearts of all the men of Judah as one man so that they sent word to the king saying, return you and all your servants. What I want you to know is the structure of this passage really helps give us the message of it. And I've already told you what it is, but I just want to show you it by the structure. The passage begins with the question of who will return to the king and, and how will they return to the king. And there's a question for Israel and a question for Judah. Well, guess what? You know how the passage is going to end? passage is going to end with the exact same thing. For the sake of time, we're not going to read verses 41 through 43 this morning, but we'll see there that about half of the nation of Israel, of the northern tribes, return along with the tribe of Judah. And what we have there is we still have turmoil. Why is that? Because Israel is for us a picture of being only half committed. And there is strife within Israel and there's turmoil within those tribes, and there's strife and turmoil between Israel and Judah. The issue of returning to the king bookends this entire passage. And so it really is the right way to understand the message of everything that's going to come in between, as we'll see in a moment. But what I want you to know now is this. In the end, this chapter sadly will end with people divided. The people will bicker with one another. There will be a civil war. There will be more, uh, more bloodshed and more carnage. The people here are really a picture of us, collectively. The people collectively are a picture of us because, because when our hearts are divided and we won't return to the king, then you know well, don't you, what the result is. Only strife and only turmoil. Christ says that you, uh, you cannot serve two masters, right? Some of you, I know, the last week or week and a half or so has been very rough. It's been very isolating. It's been very lonely, hasn't it? Uh, some of you may feel uh, very bored, um, and, and I get that. But all I know is I, I probably feel more distracted in this season. I probably feel more pulled honestly, than I have at any other time. My schedule is up in the air. There's, there's nothing normal. It's a day by day, it feels like recreating the wheel. Everything that, that I would do seems harder, more decisions to be made and more uncertainty. Brothers and sisters, don't, don't let your heart be divided in the midst of that. You can't take for granted anymore what you're going to do first thing tomorrow or later this afternoon. You can't take for granted what, what Wednesday afternoon or Thursday evening will bring. I, I, I don't know what, uh, what my plans will be like, but, but if, if we've ever needed hearts to be renewed, we need our hearts to be renewed today, don't we, regularly? If we've ever need our, needed our minds to be renewed, we, we need that today. And, and it is super easy to be distracted and, and to be pulled. I, I, confession, I'm a numbers guy, 
And so I'm, I'm fascinated, right, by the morbid numbers. And more than I should be, I'm sure, okay? Um, but it's a distraction to want to just follow and hear the latest update and know what's going on. I have to drag myself away and say, no, I need a heart renewed. I need a mind renewed. Return to the king. Will you do that? Will you do that every day? Because if there's ever a season that the world needs that, the world needs you to be that, if there's ever a season where you need that, it's this season. Return to the king. Well, we're going to see three different people then in the middle portion of our passage today. And each of these is a person whom David has met before. And each of them, in one way or another, commends to us how to return to the king. The first is Shimei. And Shimei is a warning for us. How do we return to the king? Trust him completely. That's the warning we get through Shimei. Trust him completely. Pick up with me in 2 Samuel 19, starting in verse 16. Then Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, who was from Bahirim, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. If you don't remember the story, Shimei is the guy who cursed David and his men while they were at their lowest point, being driven away from the palace. He threw rocks, he threw dust, he, he brought down curses from God on them. This is Shimei, who comes now to meet David. 17. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, with Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons and his 20 servants with him. And they rushed to the servant before the king. Sorry, they rushed to the Jordan before the king. Then they kept crossing the ford to bring over the king's household and to do what was good in his sight. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. So he said to the king, Let not my lord consider me guilty. No, remember what your servant did wrong on the day when my lord the king came out from Jerusalem so that the king would take it to heart. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come today, the first of all the house of Joseph, to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said, said to King David, Should not Shimei be put to death for this? Because he cursed the Lord's anointed. David then said, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be an adversary to me? Should any man be put to death in Israel this day? For do I not know that I am king over Israel today? Then the king said to Shimei, You shall not die. And thus the king swore to him. What we learn through this first person that we have recorded for us that David meets is the way that we are to return to the king is to trust him completely. I suppose there's a sense in which there's, there's something noble that Shimei comes and he, he offers a confession. In fact, I, I appreciate, right? Aren't you blessed that he says in, in verse 19, sorry, verse 20, your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, I come to you today. In fact, it says that he bows um, he probably falls on his face before him. David's, one of David's generals wanted to kill Shimei. The same thing nearly happened on the way out of town. But David knows he's king today. And David knows that his reign needs to be marked by something, not by vengeance. It needs to be marked by him extending his hand, even to those rebels and those traitors who have fought against him, and to say to them in love, return to me. What we actually have here in Shimei is a man who is a profound tragedy. Does Shimei get what he wants? Yes, he does. Um, David, David says you won't die. David lets him go. He allows him to live and continue. You know what's really sad? You know what's really tragic about Shimei? It's what Shimei didn't really want and never really got. Shimei didn't really get the fullness of the pardon that David offered him. Shimei didn't even come seeking that. There's every reason for us to be a little suspicious of what Shimei um, is saying here. Uh, I want you to consider that, that Shimei comes to the king at this point, and he comes with his pockets full. He, he, he comes with, with stuff to bargain with, right? Did you notice how he came down? He came down with a thousand men, right? Um, did, did you see that back in verse, where is it, 17? This is Shimei trying to send the message to the king. Hey, it would be good for you. I'd love it if you would forgive me. And by the way, look at all these dudes that are following me. Um, hey, if you get me, you get all of them as well. 
These thousand men are a bargaining chip. Ziba and his whole household are, in some sense, along with Shimei, a bargaining chip. And, and do you notice what Shimei claims? He says, I'm the first of all of the, of the household of Joseph. These are those who might naturally be prone to be enemies of David because of their lineage. And, and so he's, he's hinting again at David, if you get me, I would be the first to help lead maybe this entire family and tribe back to you. How sad this is that Shimei comes this way. If I was David, and I think David gets it, he can, he can see through Shimei. If I was David, I'd, I'd be prone to want to respond like Abishai wants to. Seriously, after all that this guy has done to us, let's just take his head and be done with it. Thankfully, I'm not God. And thankfully, I'm not David. And David in this moment extends mercy, profound mercy, pardoning mercy. Verse 23, you shall not die. In that statement, he lets him know all is well and you are free to return. I think the message we get from Shimei for you and I in how we should return to the king is obviously not to return like Shimei, but rather we should trust him completely. We should trust the king with everything. What does that mean? It means for us to not be like Shimei and, and come with bargaining chips and, and say, Lord, you know what? I, I really want to follow you and I want your blessings. Uh, I don't want punishment. And, and hey, look, I, I have some things to offer and I kind of want to do it this way. No, I think we should come not holding anything back. I, I think Shimei teaches us that we should come not, not bargaining. I think what's tragic about Shimei is I, I truly believe that the word of forgiveness, the word of grace that's spoken in verse 23, it never takes root in Shimei. He comes in appearance to make a confession and repentance, and he gets a word, I think, really, that David is so smart to speak because it's a word that tests him. If all you want to hear is you won't get punished, then you can go. But if what you really want to hear is you're free to know me, you're free to love me, you're free to have more of me, then here's your opportunity, come further. Shimei doesn't. There's a rest of a story with Shimei that I won't go through. Uh, we'll find that it ends badly for Shimei. David keeps his word, he does not take Shimei's life. But I think Shimei's insincerity is clearly demonstrated in, in the chapters that come and in how his end will be met. For those who would return to the king, the way that we are to do it is to come and trust completely. This is the way that the greater David, the, the anointed king of God, Jesus, came later and called people to himself with total trust to, to completely lay everything aside. Mark 1, he says, follow me and I will, I will make you fishers of men. In that call, he's saying, look, if you'll trust me completely, I'll change you. I'll make you into something that you don't know. In Luke 5, it says that those fishermen left everything and followed Jesus. Friend, there's a question for you today as you may be going through this hard season. Are you willing to leave everything to follow Jesus? That might be crazy scary. But here's the incredibly good news. Christ says it's really simple. Follow me and I will make you. Christ will say later in John 15, abide in me and, and you will bear fruit. He says, if your eyes are on me, if you follow me, if you dwell in me, then I will give you life, I will give you fruit, and I will change you radically. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. You see what's so tragic about Shimei? There's no change. There's no transformation. Why? Because he has no interest in that. This is all appearances. And so I believe, as best as we can tell from Scripture, that Shimei will die in his sins and die in his stubbornness, die not only estranged from David and his lineage, but, but die, by, die estranged from the one true God. Friend, if you don't know Christ and you've never been willing to trust him completely, maybe this season is the one where he's asking you, are you ready yet to return to the king? If you do, he will do the rest. He will make you. He will bear fruit through you. He will transform you. And there will be in you new affections. There will be a new wisdom. There will be a new love. There will be new desires. 
and there will be God's help every step of the way. Well, that's the first person we meet. The second is Mephibosheth, and if you've been with us through Samuel, you know that name and you love that name. Mephibosheth, the man who was crippled when David became king because he was from the household of the enemy, and as, a, as, a, as an infant boy or a small lad, a servant from that household took him up to, to run off with him and keep him safe, and in the process tripped and fell, and Mephibosheth bore the brunt of that fall and was crippled in his legs and has been for the rest of his life. He comes from a, a condemned house. He should have had his life forfeit, as was often done in that day. And he, he comes in, in a broken body and with a broken life. And yet in 2 Samuel 9, David gave Mephibosheth grace and, and a place at the table and so much love. But in the meantime, when David left, Mephibosheth was slandered by his servant Ziba. Ziba told a lie about him. I won't go through all that story, but let's pick up now as Mephibosheth is the second to meet David. And what we'll see as all those wrongs that happened before get righted when, when David learns the rest of the story today, what we learn from, the, from, from Mephibosheth, that's easy to say, is how to return to the king in this way. Come back to the king as your treasure. Come back to the king as your treasure. Pick up verse 24. Then Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and he had neither cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes, clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came home in peace. It was when he came from Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? So he answered, O oh my lord, the king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle my donkey, saddle a donkey for myself, that I may ride on it and go with the king, because your servant is lame. Moreover, he has slandered your servant, my lord the king, but my lord the king is like the angel of God. Therefore do what is good in your sight. For all my father's household was nothing but dead men before my lord the king. Yet you sent your servant among those who ate at your table. What right do I have yet that I should complain any more to the king? So the king said to him, Why do you still speak of your affairs? I have decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. Mephibosheth said to the king, Let him even take it all, since my lord the king has come safely to his own house. Pause there. What do we see in Mephibosheth? We see of him that the king is his treasure. Mephibosheth had been wronged. Ziba was a conniving servant. David told Ziba to, to manage the house and the fields and, and everything that that Mephibosheth was given the right to own. Ziba and his sons and his servants were to manage the whole thing with all of the household. But Ziba comes and tells a lie to David and gets David to give Ziba the power over the whole house. David returns and he finds out the truth at this point. Mephibosheth now comes and speaks the truth. And he's been wronged. Question, what would you want if you're in Mephibosheth's place? For these, for these days, or maybe it's been weeks, I don't know how long David was in exile. I don't know how long the preparations for the battle and the marching of the armies and everything else and the battle itself all took. But Mephibosheth all this time has not cut his hair or trimmed his beard or, or cleaned himself or anything else. Why? Because he's been in mourning. And Ziba has taken over the household that was rightly belonging to him. Now he gets the opportunity to speak to David. What does he most want? He wants justice, right? He wants justice. Or does he? You see what's beautiful about Mephibosheth is he doesn't even really want justice. He just wants to be back in David's graces. He just wants the friendship with David again. David makes a very unusual ruling here in 29 where he, he splits all of the household halfway between Ziba and Mephibosheth. I think there are a lot of good reasons for that. I think David at this point appreciates that Ziba has done some good things for him, which I won't take this moment to review. But at this moment, he's not prepared, I think, to, to uh, make a, a knee-jerk ruling that's going to potentially be destructive. So he says, Mephibosheth, you will have more than what you need. And, and Ziba, he will have a place as well. Again, this is the king's policy, even to rebels, even to liars and deceivers. He comes and he extends grace and he says, there is a place in my kingdom 
What I love about Mephibosheth, the one who has come, the one who already has experienced grace and favor, he says, my household, my father's household was nothing but dead men before the Lord, my Lord the King, but you set your servant among those who eat at his table. He says, I have known your favor, King. I've known your grace. I've known your love, and I don't have any complaints. I don't have anything I want. When David says here, you can have back half the land, he says, you know what? As far as I'm concerned, Ziba can keep all of it because the king is home today, and that's all that matters to me. The beauty of the message that we get through Mephibosheth is that the king is our treasure. Not his gifts, not even his justice, not even him making everything right, not him fixing our circumstances, not all of his blessings, though God does, does reward his servants. He does reward faithfulness. But what you and I, brother and sister in Christ, long for most of all, what we're made for most of all, is the king himself. He's our treasure, and nothing can take him from us. Might that we would be like Mephibosheth and say, hang it all, they can have it, since my Lord the King has come home in peace this day. The word that is used there, by the way, is the Hebrew word shalom. There is wholeness now. There is peace now because the rightful King is on the throne, and that's all I want. The psalmist Echoing the same sentiment of, of Mephibosheth would say, O oh Lord, your loving kindness is better than life itself. The Apostle Paul will write in Philippians 3 and he'll say, I regard all things as lost. They're rubbish. They're garbage to me compared to the surpassing richness of, of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, will that be our cry this week? Will you return to the king as your treasure? What will it take to make you and me turn off the news, and put down the phone, close the laptop? What will it take for us in the midst of, of, of all the uncertainty and, and locks that we do need to attend to because of that uncertainty, yet still say, but I will carve out time because I don't care about any of this. Even if this all was going great, the one thing that matters most is that I could be with my king because he's my treasure. And the question is whether or not your life and, and my life in these days will bear that out. How do we return to the king? Return to him as your treasure. Make him your priority this week. Third, and finally, how do we return to the king? Be satisfied in his service. Be satisfied in his service. The third person that we meet is Barzillai. Pick up with me in verse 31. Now Barzillai the Gileadite had come down from Rogalim, and he went on to the Jordan with the king to escort him over the Jordan. Now Barzillai was very old, being 80 years old, and he had sustained the king while he stayed in Mahanaim, for he was a very great man. The king said to Barzillai, You cross over with me, and I will sustain you in Jerusalem with me. But Barzillai said to the king, How long have I yet to live, that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am now 80 years old. Can I distinguish between good and bad? Or can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Or can I hear any more the voice of singing men and women? Why then should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? Your servant would merely cross over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king compensate me with this reward? Please, let your servant return, that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and my mother. However, here is your servant, Kimham. Let him cross over with my lord the king, and do for him whatever is good in your sight. The king answered, Kimham shall cross over with me, and I will do for him what is good in your sight, and whatever you require of me, I will do for you. And the people crossed over the Jordan, and the king crossed too. The king then kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his place. Pause there. Pause there. I, I, I love Barzillai the Gileadite. You guys know that I, I love Barzillai the Gileadite. You love Barzillai the Gileadite by now. First, first we love him, right? just because of his name, right? It really, really pops. Barzillai the Gileadite. But, but we love Barzillai not just because of his name, right? We love Barzillai because in him we meet a man of complete contentment. This is a, this is a man who is wise and he's wealthy and he's aged, but, but his, 
His years have not made him any less sharp or passionate or zealous to serve God and to serve God's king. This was the man, remember, just a short chapter and a half ago, together with uh, Makir and Shobi, comes out on the hills of Mahanaim, and they come up with donkeys and camels and just an, an entire entourage of, of, of food and beds and basins and um, sheep and animals and everything that David and all of his families and all of his men might need. This is a man who is sharp to love God's king and to love God. His age has not dulled him one bit. And not only that, what's also sweet, his riches, his wealth, has not dulled him one bit. Here, here is a man who loves God, and he just wants to be in the center of his will. What a blessing this man is. Everything he owns is bent as a resource for God's purpose. And he's completely happy in serving the king. David now is returning to the throne. Barzillai comes down today, probably with some men, maybe even with some more provisions. I don't know. He just wants to be there as the parade goes past and, and just celebrate the king and just rejoice that the king is rightfully coming back home. But David has other thoughts, doesn't he? David is thinking this day to reward Barzillai. In the end, they will settle on Kimham. We don't know who Kimham is. Uh, possibly he's Barzillai's son. Likely he is. There are hints later in Scripture that David did clearly and faithfully bless Kimham because there's a record of uh, a town, I believe it is, that's named after him. David provides for him, and his name kind of goes down in history, Kimham. But all the blessing that Kimham gets is is because of Barzillai. By the way, there's another tiny picture of the gospel, right? Everything that you and I get as a blessing from God is not because of us. It's because of somebody else's righteousness. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, his perfect life, his faithful death, and his sacrifice earns the reward for you and me that if we believe, we benefit from. Well, Barzillai knows. He knows that, that he could go back to the palace he, he could be in the place and he could, he could eat the royal food. But what's his argument? Don't you love it? He says, you know, it really doesn't matter to me if it's truffles or it's a PB&J. It's kind of all the same at my age. Um, I'm good with duck all orange or a rice cake. Barzillai knows if he goes back to the palace that there will be royal players. And, and that every other weekend that, that Hamilton is being performed in the courts. He knows that Pavarotti will be, will be singing operas every, every morning, right? But he says, you know, I, I really don't care. Uh, there's a sparrow that sits outside my window and sings to me, and I'm good with that. The crickets, all that's good. Barzillai is a man of such prof profound contentment. He just wants to go home and sit in his garden. He just wants to tend faithfully to his duties. He wants to die with his ancestors. That's all he asks for. He has come this day to honor David because he is a man of deep faith. He wants to come and give honor to God and give honor to the king. And when the king comes to honor him, he says, you know what? Thank you, but I, I honestly don't even need it because I have enough. I think in a sense he is a glimpse of what it will be like on that day. As scripture says of every faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially of those who have, who have suffered persecution or shame for his name, especially of those who have stood up in hard times or those who have made sacrifices for the name of Christ and loved their neighbors, spoken his word, and even rescued some from death, especially for those, the Lord Jesus Christ will say to them, well done, good and faithful servant. And scripture says that there are crowns, there are some kind of, of symbols or tokens of, of reward, of honor given to faithful servants. And scripture says that you know what will happen in that day? It will be just like Barzillai. Lord God, thanks for this honor, but I, but, but I honestly don't even need it. It's, it's enough to have you. I am content in you. And they will cast their crowns back at his feet in the best sense. Barzillai is looking forward to those words that Jesus promises his father will say to all those who serve faithfully in his name. 
In Matthew 25, Come ye, blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We seek for many things to satisfy us, don't we? But those who know God's anointed son, who know the rightful king, they know that the only place that we're truly satisfied is in our king himself and being satisfied in his service. I love Barzillai the Gileadite, but I don't care even if he had a silly name, <laughs> one that didn't roll off the tongue. I wish I could be like this man. We wish we could be more like this man, content and satisfied in service. Brothers and sisters, in a day of divided loyalties, how will we follow the one true king? Will you return to the king every day this week? Will you make it your priority? Throughout the day, many times, will you return to the king? Our world needs it. You need it, and I need it. The question is, will you and I look back on this season and will we be able to say, you know, that was the season of the return of the king. I pray that we'd look back and we'd say that our life with the Lord was richer at this point in our lives than it ever was at any point before this, and it might take us to new heights forever going forward. Join me and let's um, close together and pray. Gracious God, our Father, we um, pray if any hear this, or are watching this this morning who don't yet know you as a treasure. They only know you as a God, as a judge, and maybe fearfully as, as one at a distance because they have never come to know that you died for them. You sacrificed. You extend to them as a rebel your love and your grace. I pray if this is you today, friend, that you would return to the one true king because he is good at forgiving rebels. He will give you a place in his kingdom. He will make you a new creation. He will make you. He will bear fruit through you. Would you trust him? Would you trust him completely and lay down everything? Brothers and sisters, we come this morning to our Lord. Father, we come together and we do just say, you are king. You reign today and you sit on your throne. Would you give us strength to come to you each day, to know your power? Might we look on this season and say, that was the richest season I've ever known with my Lord. We trust you. We just proclaim today you are, you are sovereign over our nation. You are sovereign over our government, over our businesses, over, over our health, Lord. You are sovereign and you are Lord. And the church of Jesus Christ will not end until the day when you return and we see you face to face. You have promised it and you will do it. Lord, we just want to return to you as our king today and throughout this, king, this week. Help us. Help us do it well. Give us a heart to desire it and remind us often. Be glorified as you bear fruit in us. All this we ask to your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for being here with us and worshiping this morning. God bless you, and look for our daily morning devotionals at 9 o'clock each day. God bless. Thanks.